Sleep well, my sweet pea. May angels guard you through the night. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and mommy loves you so very much. These are the words that I have spoken each night since Brayden came into my life a little over two years ago. I have spoken them to a very awake boy as I have laid him in his crib, or whispered them over an already peacefully sleeping little ball gripping tightly onto his stuffed monkey. <laughs> when he was a little baby, he would just stare at me when I said them. And then about a year ago, we had a few months where he wouldn't even let me speak them out loud. He had finally put two and two together, you see, that that meant it was time for nighttime, bedtime. Now, if I'm home in time, he waits for me to say them before closing his eyes and drifting off to sleep. Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms, and that's why I chose those very words to share with Brayden in our nighttime ritual. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And much like Brayden's reaction to those words has changed, our reaction to hearing those words changes too, depending on where we are in our relationship with God, perhaps. One minute we are content just to hear the words that call us sacred and beloved. And then there are those times when we try not to own up to our own sacredness or to acknowledge that God is even with us on our journeys. And other times, there are those moments when we wait for those words as they work to energize and to inspire us for our work and our ministries in the world. The psalmist realized in these verses read today that God is such a mystery that we cannot ever fully understand. And yet that mystery decided to create each of us in our own way, our own faults and weaknesses, our own gifts and skills, our own identities, but all as sacred and special, the things of awe and wonder. Now the things of awe and wonder for someone like Brayden at just over two years old are things like starting to count or to say the ABCs, feeding a bunny out in nature at the campground or riding a two-wheel bike and lighting up the room with just a giggle. And don't those things change as we grow older? The things of awe and wonder as we journey to adulthood are perhaps things like when a child comes into our life, when we meet the person we want to give our life over to as partner or spouse, when out of all of the people in the world, we meet that one person who becomes our very best friend. And the things of miracle are perhaps when a big project we are working on comes to fruition, when we're able to encourage someone to do something they didn't think was possible. When, for all intents and purposes, we realize that God is working through us in something we say or do, not just in a church function, but out in the world, in our regular Monday through Saturday lives as well. Many people have learned how to pray by praying the Psalms, which are full of raw emotion. If you ever have a moment, you should sit with them someday. <laughs> if you're ever afraid that you can't say something to God, just look at the Psalmists. There you go. Because the interaction between the psalmist and God marks a dynamic relationship with a God who speaks to humans, one who breaks into our lives on a regular basis. They speak to a relationship with a God who doesn't have to ask us for our identification because he knows us through and through as a function of the way he created us. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in various settings, classes, conferences, work meetings, retreats, where they've asked me to describe myself and depending on where you are or who you are with, the answer tends to be different, right? Where you start, which label you decide to use first, because we all grow to have a variety of different labels attached to us, different ones at different times in our lives. I am a wife, mother, daughter, aunt, pastor, friend, and so on and so on down the line. And our identification does revolve around those labels at some points. Yet even in my circles at church meetings, when I've been asked to say something about myself, I have never said, my name is Jennifer. I am a fearfully and wonderfully made child of God and sister to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> because even in my circles, you know, those really churchy ones, considering we tend not to be super evangelical in our denomination, people may admittedly get a little freaked out by that. <laughs> but you have to wonder how we might treat one another or carry ourselves and conduct our personal business a bit differently if we acknowledged both ourselves and others as God's precious creations, called and commissioned to do God's work in our every word and deed. That is the kind of identification that Paul is appealing to in his letter to Philemon. There is a personal spoken feeling to this letter, and that's why I thanked Joni that she read it, because that really is the way that it should have been received. The energy and motivation with which Paul is writing and appealing to Philemon is the joy he feels with his identity as a child of God and someone who works to promote God's mission in the world. And he identifies Onesimus, a slave, as someone who has changed his own identity 
and become a person who now understands and knows the joy of being in God's corner too, and someone who Paul wants to invite along on his mission as well. So it's not with an eye on useless coercion that Paul writes his letter to Philemon, but rather he relies on Philemon's love for other believers, his knowledge of the great commandment as a follower of Jesus Christ to help him make the decision about how to treat Onesimus, his former slave. After all, a slave who had run away was a slave who could be subject to all manner of abuse, burning, branding, even death. So Paul is not only suggesting that Philemon accept Onesimus back without consequence, but that Philemon acknowledge Onesimus as a brother in faith. Without saying so outright, it was as if Paul was saying to Philemon, your identification, please? Seeing if what Philemon said in his faith and what he would make as a decision or follow in action actually matched one another. Well, here's a question that may seem a little bit out of left field, but hang in there with me and we'll get back on the train in just a second. Have you ever spent any time with a placemat at a restaurant or a small child's activity book where there are connect the dot puzzles? Right? Usually, even without a pen, one can figure out what the connect the dots pictures are going to be. But Ryan and I were out recently at a restaurant where the placemats had activities to keep the people busy while they wait, can tell the classy establishments that we frequent. Two of which were connect the dots puzzles, right? One was fairly easy, a seal with a ball on its nose, right? But we didn't have a pen. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out what the other one was. We sat there and traced it with our fingers, had no idea at all. Well, there are certainly times, I would opt to say, in all of our lives that turn out like that. When we and others can look at what we say and what we do and not connect the dots to come up with a Christian. And then there are moments when our everyday lives, our Monday through Saturday lives, truly match with what we speak and learn about here in this sacred space together on Sundays. The picture and our identification as God's beloved fearfully and wonderfully made children, suddenly becomes clear. So the questions then become, in our everyday lives, where is it that we are asked for our identification as God's people? And where is it that we are able to hand it over with confidence? Where is it that we tie our everyday lives together with what we hear and learn about in the stories of our ancestors and faith in the Bible and are called and commissioned to do as we gather together on Sunday mornings? Well, on this Labor Day weekend, it is good to be reminded that our identification as people of faith is not something that we pick up like our name tags as we come into the meeting house, and it's not something that we leave at the door as we walk out. Rather, God recognizes a holiness, a sacredness to our everyday Monday through Saturday lives, to the work we do, whether in or out of our homes, the way that we volunteer places, the many ways that we fill our time. The truth is that there should be movement between God's church and God's world with an understanding that the decisions we make and the actions we take really do matter to God, our God, who invites us to be partners in making the world more trustworthy, just, and life-giving for all of creation. The name Onesimus itself means useful. So where is it that we are being Onesimus? Where is it that we are being used for God's service in our everyday, ordinary lives? When we identify those places, you see, they become much more than ordinary after all. As we celebrate Labor Day tomorrow, I am thankful for the many ways in which, we each, in which each and every person sitting here and associated with the Congregational Church of Brookfield is gifted. No two the same. I am grateful for the ways that we are equipped to go out into the world in our daily labor, no matter what that might be, to share God's love and Christ's message with others. And as we celebrate Labor Day, we are encouraged, just as Paul encouraged Philemon through the words of his letter, to be the best people we can be for God. In today's scripture passages, we are both comforted and challenged to remember who we are as faithful people. The psalmist speaks of being fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator who knows us now, has known us since our formation and our mother's wombs, and will continue to know us even after we have left this earth. And believe it or not, loves each and every one of us anyway. God has an unconditional love for us that cannot be explained whether we are following our faith and its tenets to the letter or are like two-year-olds pitching fits and deciding what we think is best for ourselves outside of the life-giving love of God. To God, we are the things of awe and wonder, and we have the potential to act as miracles in the lives of others and in our world. In that love, God invites us to be in a relationship that gives us new life, protection, forgiveness, and grace. And that invitation is not given in order to weigh us down but rather to lift us up and make it easier to offer up our identification as followers of Christ when asked. May we remember that invitation in the everyday moments of our lives, 
when working and playing, when connecting dots, eating blow pops, and carrying out our nighttime rituals. And may we accept that invitation so when we hear the words, identification please, others will know who and whose we are. Amen. <laughs>